testing, testing, testing. Okay, the light is on at least for now. Today is November 17, 1987. My name is Rebecca Sharpless and I'm interviewing for the first time Susan Nagy. The interview is taking place at my apartment actually, um, 1455 Willow Lake Drive, apartment D in Atlanta, Georgia. Susan is support staff for Coldwell Banker right now here in Atlanta, but we're going to be talking a lot about her previous experience at an insurance company tonight. It's part of a project on working women in Atlanta. Um, Susan, I just want to start out real basically tonight and get you to tell me your whole name. Susan Nagy. Okay, no middle name. No, Not I don't usually, I don't, I don't go by a middle name. I have one, but... <laughs> Okay, we'll pretend that it's just under there. I'm called by my middle name. I understand. Um, how long have you been involved in office work? Um, for about seven years, I guess. Okay, what was your first job in an office? It was at um, Equitable uh, Insurance Company and Deep House Science Administration. Okay, what did your job there entail? My title was benefits prover. I started out as a um, dental approver, where you reviewed claims that um, clients had sent in. You decided whether or not the claims were payable according to the particular policy that the claimant, you know, was under, and then you paid the claim. You well, you um, filled out the paperwork that would enable someone else to type up the check. On, Okay. When you first went there, um, how was that procedure done? What kind of technology was involved? It was all manual. You, you filled out paperwork. You, um, they did have computer cards that it, it was kind of a script system. I'm not real familiar exactly how it, how it worked, but I was not involved at all on the computer end of that. Um, we, like I said, looked at the claim. You um, coded things depending on what kind of procedure it was. Each procedure had a specific code. You'd um, fill out the form, you know, with the code in the proper place, the amount of charge, and basically that was it. You just kind of uh, paper clipped it to this computer card and set it in stacks to go to the person who actually typed them on the computer and it went onto a magnetic strip that was on the card. And from there, the check was issued. But like I said, I didn't have anything to do with any computerized system. My part of it was just the paperwork. Did you, you fill those out by hand or with the typewriter? Just by hand. Pencil. Really? Hmm. Okay. Um, what skills were involved in there? Um, they really, when I first started working there, they, they did not um, have any uh, basic requirement. They, they took people right out of high school. You didn't have to have a college degree. Um, they preferred that you had previous office experience of some sort because they just felt that people who had worked in an office before knew how to act more in an office atmosphere, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who just worked, had worked retail jobs or whatever. Um, I had had a, an associate degree in dental hygiene, and so they liked me a lot because I already knew the dental terminology and everything. So when they saw me, they said, "Yes, we want to hire you," because they didn't. There wasn't going to be so much to the training, mm -hmm. since I already understood all the procedural part of it, and it was just a matter of finding, figuring out how they paid the claims. You know, that's all I had to learn. Yeah, you didn't have to learn the dental procedure, right? That how many people were there in the office with you? Um, when we first started, um, different operations were all over the place in the equitable building. Um, I was on the dental floor and there were about, I suppose, about 50 dental approvers. Then they also had medical people that were on the upper floor that I don't know at, the time, at that time how many people they had working medical. But within four months when I started there, we moved out of that building and consolidated operations into one floor in another office building. And at that point, we had about 210 people all together. In the dental? No, in, in the entire dental and medical combined. Okay. How well did you know the other people in the dental section? Um, pretty well, because, I mean, you basically all work together. I did have my own 
my own group that I paid claims for this particular uh, group of people. So, you know, once you got your um, the policy down pat, it was pretty quick. We went pretty quickly with the claims. Um, we did have a quota of like 50 a day, but those were pretty. They were pretty easy to be able to do that because dental claims, as a general rule, aren't very difficult. There are only a number of procedures that you can do in the mouth. <laughs> so once you got, you know, got that down, they were pretty easy to pay and. Um, I knew, I mean, you knew everybody. It was almost, almost like um, your homeroom class in high school or something, you know, because everyone was, knew everybody. Although there were a little, you know, click type, you know, little friends that hung around together. But everybody got, well, we didn't get along well, no, I shouldn't say that, but everybody knew one, one another pretty well. 50 claims an hour, that, 50 claims a day, that's a little more than six an hour, mm -hmm. one every 10 minutes. Yeah, so it wasn't, wasn't all that much, yeah. Um, how much did you, well, you kind of addressed this, how much did you interact with your co-workers in the course of the day? Um, well, when, when we first started in the new office, then what they had were like um, four desks put together. So you basically, when you looked up, you were looking at two other people directly in front of you and then one other person like to your side. And we um, didn't necessarily have to interact a lot to do our work, but we did interact a lot simply because there were other people there that you could talk to. And when you were paying these claims over and over and over again, it got to be so automatic that you didn't really have to think about what you were doing. So we used to chatter a lot. And within about a year, no, come to think of it, that's not true. It was about, it was after we automated that they put up the partitions between us so that we could no longer talk to one another. <laughs> and they had them in little swastika shapes. So that's the way these, these partitions were. So it was still four desks together, but you had a little swastika that the little desks were in these <laughs> inside of the swastika. <laughs> But we, we did not have to interact a lot in the payment of the claims. You did have um, like a manager that if you had a problem with a claim, you could go to her to you know, help you figure out what you should do with that particular claim. Why did they so, want to stop you from chattering? Um, they felt it cut down on stuff. Were you yeah. still making your 50 a day? Or oh, yeah, because it wasn't difficult to do at that point. Well. So how long did you work there doing these claims for the tenth time? Um, let's see. It was about probably about a year and a half maybe that we were um, on a manual system. Then they um, decided to computerize everything because they felt it would be a little bit more efficient if they would cut out the people who were typing these things up. You know, typing it on the, the cards with the magnetic magnetic strip and, and typing the checks because um, they, they did both. The people who were the typists, they typed the, mag the card with magnetic strip and they typed out a draft separately. And what the system that they set up then, the approver directly input the code, the information about the claim, the, um, you know, the code for that particular procedure and the amount. In, on a computer screen and you just punched a button and in, at least in Pennsylvania somewhere a check was um, typed up and sent out so that kind of cut out I guess it cut out about 10 position, positions that right there cut out about 10 positions so to typists. about 20% of the office um, no, out of your section out of 200, out of 200 people okay. they cut out about 10 okay so it wasn't 5% yeah. so um, we were put through a real extensive training program and it was about six weeks in training. Well, what happened was six weeks we were in training for the morning and then in the afternoon we'd come back and we'd just keep doing manual claims. And then once we finished the six week training program, then they went on to the computerized system. Okay, let's back up. Can you say um, they decided, who decided? They decided to go on computer. Um, the people in uh, our home office in New York. They um, felt that it would be more 
it was one step towards being a little bit more cost efficient. We were on a, a mixed door system for that. A what? It was called mixed door mixed door computer. I think they're pretty much um, mm -hmm. phased out. I mean, people don't use those things anymore. They're all antiquated. And I guess it was a real large type of machine too, but it was not. No, we went on to a, um, a Raytheon CRT. I don't know exactly what kind of um, you know, database system they had and all, but that was all in Pennsylvania. We just had the Raytheon terminal on it. Um, How did the management tell you that you were going online? Gosh, that's even hard to remember. Um, It was more or less, I mean, we kind of all knew before they made a, a real announcement about it. Uh, as far as I can remember, they made an announcement at a, a regular meeting that, um, you know, we had a, like a lunchroom area that it was large enough to hold all the employees and they took us in there and told us, you know, as of such and such a date, we are going to start on this computerized system and you will go through this period of training and then, you know, and they, they explained everything to us. although. We pretty much knew. In fact, I think I knew when I first started there. They told me that you know we're doing it this way now, but they're um, they have in the works this computerized system that as soon as they get it perfected, they're going to um, have us start paying claims this way. So it was known well in advance that they were going to be doing this. What were your coworkers' <coughs> reactions to it? A lot of women were, uh, and it was mostly women. I think. Out of the 200 people, I think we had about 10 men, and um, a couple of them were in management positions. But and I think there were maybe six men that were in approver positions like myself. And um, a, a lot of the women were apprehensive about it because they felt that, well, I don't know anything about a computer. Um, what if I can't do this? What if I, I you know? I'll lose my job because I won't be able to learn the computer system. And, you know, they said, don't worry, we've got this extensive training program. And they really did. I mean, um, I really can't say anything bad about the company in terms of what they did because it, it just made logical sense. It really did. I mean, it did cut out a lot of jobs, and I'll get into that more later too, but that it really made more sense to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was it was a good change. And I was real excited about it because I had taken, a, well, up to that point, I don't know if I had taken a course in computers in college yet, but um, I was excited about learning the computer system. You know, to me, that was, oh good, I'm gonna learn something new. But there were a lot of women that were real afraid of it because they hadn't had any experience with it. And, was there any correlation between age and the apprehension level? No, not really, because it seemed like a lot of the younger women were even more afraid of it hmm. than some of the older women who were more open to it. Um, maybe that was an unusual situation, but that's what I remember that the younger women were real scared of it. Did everybody in the section go in the morning at the same time? Um, Everyone in a particular group, like everyone who was um, paying the dental claims, we all went in there together. The people who were in the medical section that paid a certain kind of claim, for example, ITT was one of our groups, and everyone in ITT went in at a certain time. So you were basically in the class with the same people that you worked with. Do you want to sit that down on the table you can you can't you can't post the finish? <laughs> That's okay. I'll, okay. I'll do it. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you weren't holding on to it out of respect for my table <laughs> And so um, everybody in your group went together. How did they begin oh, um, who did the training? They had a woman who um, had previously been a school teacher and she was also a nurse. I guess she had a couple of, <laughs> well, I guess what it was, she was a nurse and then she had taught at nursing school or something like that. But she, she was a teacher and she was certified as a teacher. And um, she was the one that held the training classes. And then she also had a couple people that were like helping her that would go around when you were learning a certain procedure and if somebody got stuck, you know, they had little helpers to go help people out. 
that um, she was basically responsible for. And, um, you know, the, the way they set up the training program and all that was all done in New York, in the home office. And I felt they had done that very well, too. I mean, they, they definitely planned this thing out step by step, and they did not release it to us until they had all the bugs worked out of it. They really did very well. How did the training work? I mean, what was the procedure on them? They start and say, this is a computer? Um, they had, like, workbooks that, um, yeah, they described, started out describing what the computer terminal was all about and, you know, how the keyboard, how it was similar to a typewriter. and. Um, what different keys you were going to be using and uh, oh. what the little different lights on the computer terminal meant because there were like, I don't know, six different lights and when a certain thing lit up that meant a certain thing. So they described all that. Then um, we also had like uh, in the workbook little exercises that you'd go through like how to sign on and how to do different things on a computer, how to get to different screens and stuff like that. You do that all in the workbook and then you'd have a hands-on practice right there too. Because they, they had the classroom set up with terminals for each person. Was that there in the building? <coughs> yeah, it was right on the same floor. How well did everyone catch on? Um, well, I suppose it was like any classroom situation where, you know, some people lag behind some others and you have to wait for them to catch up. And, but, I mean, it was a pretty simple, straightforward system. And we did have six weeks worth of training, which I thought was great. I mean, a lot of companies don't give you that kind of thing. I mean, it was only half a day, but grant, granted, but it still was, I felt, was more than sufficient. I mean, when I got out of there, I was very confident that I knew exactly what I was doing. What took six weeks? The procedure that you described to me before with the pencil sounded pretty simple. <laughs> okay, um, I think a lot of it was um, also they were doubling up on the training. It was not only computer training, but it was also like a refresher course on how you're supposed to be paying claims. That was incorporated into it too. So, and we spent a lot of time too just talking about, you know, feelings about things. They, they did let you, you know, express how you were feeling about what was going on and all. So, I mean, it was, um, it was fun. I enjoyed the classes a lot. I really did. So after six weeks, you came back to an automated office? We went online. How did that go? Um, well, for the first few days, you know, we had people that were running around scared that, you know, oh, I, I just screwed something up. <laughs> but um, it, it went pretty smoothly. And within a real short period of time, when we first started on the new system, they said, you know, look, you're going to be a lot slower than you were when you were paying your 50 claims a day, you know, manually, because you're on a new system and you have to get used to it. And, you know, after you get used to it, you'll build up your speed and all. And they gave us Gosh, I'm trying to think. I can't remember anymore if it was just a one month or if it was a three month. Three months sticks in my mind that you had a three month period to get your production back up. And so, I mean, they did give you leeway there that, you know, gave, gave you enough time to really get used to what you were doing and get your production back up to the level that they expected. So, it was. It, it wasn't even chaotic. I wouldn't even describe it as chaotic at first. It was a little bit, you know, weird the first couple of days. But people pretty much got right into it. So you worked at a CRT eight hours a day? How did that go? Um, for the first couple of months, I used to get headaches constantly. By the end of the day, I mean, I could not focus. I, I'd, be able, I'd go home and I'd try to read something and my eyes just would not focus. And I didn't understand, I, I didn't really relate it at first to the CRT, you know, I, and the headaches too. I thought that I was just stressed out, you know, just it was that time of year or whatever <laughs> that I just, you know, was having these headaches all the time. But then I finally realized that I think that's what it was, was, it, was adjusting to the computer screens. 
but after a couple months working on it, um, the headaches went away and the eye strain went away. My eyes eventually adjusted to having to deal with that every day. What kind of screen did you have? Um, it's. I mean, was it green or? Oh yeah, it was green. All, all it was green on black. Did, yeah. yeah. And we did have um, glare screens on them for sure. Um, <coughs> How did the program work? Did it like come up in, in a form to be filled out, or? Um, well, first you had to um, you want to sign on with your personal ID code, and then what you would do to bring up the claimants like history and take a look at because first of all you had to look at their history to find out what you paid before to determine whether or not you could pay for this one and that it wasn't a duplicate and that sort of thing. How did you do that before? Um, it was on a card. It's typed on that card with the magnetic strip. Things were typed out. Okay. Um, so you did, you know, you had to type in their social security number and it brought up their, um, and the claimant's name and that sort of thing. It was just all as a string on the top line. And you typed that in and it brought up, um, depending on what you typed in the string, whether you wanted to see their history or whether you wanted to bring up a payment screen or whatever, you know you just type that in there and it would bring up a screen. Um, on the top of the screen, for example, a payment screen, it had um, uh, information about the person, like a birth date and that sort of thing, so that you could double check to make sure you were paying it on the right person. Um, then it had just, you know, blank for you to type in the code, the date, um, there was a starting date and ending date if it was like a hospital stay or something. By the way, I paid dental for about a year and a half, and when we went online, very, very soon after we went online, within six months after we went online, I became a medical for the Goddess Moon Medical Foundation. But anyway, that had a beginning date and ending date. They had to type in um, the charge, and I think that was basically all that was on that screen. So you just had to type that in there, and then you hit another button and another screen would come up to so that you could type in, put in the provider's name and address and all that for if the check was, well, either way, you'd have to put that in and then determine whether or not the check was supposed to be paid to them or to be paid to the claimant, one or the other. But um, I mean, it was, it was pretty simple. There weren't that many different kind of screens that you could pull up. There were maybe five. What did you do when you messed up? Um, you had to fill out a form saying, I messed up, stop this claim, <laughs> you know, from being paid because the checks weren't cut until that, that night. And um, if you went in, you could do a certain procedure. Well, you couldn't do it. The supervisor could do it. When we did go on the computerized system, what they did was create another position that uh, a supervisory position that was not a manager, but a person who they called it a technical assistant that could help you out with problems. And she was authorized to like void out checks. And so you'd have to, um, you know, fill out certain paperwork and give it to her, and she would go in and void that a particular a particular transaction. And you were still working in a block of four desks. Mm -hmm. How did the computers affect that? Um, you got less desk space, but um, they they kept us in the same configuration. I mean, they, they really didn't change that very, very much. Did you speak chat? Yeah, if you poked your head up like that. But, <laughs> but, but um, they also, I don't know, it was easier to spot someone who was chatting because you did have to poke your head up. They were only like maybe four foot partitions, but they were high enough that you had to kind of peek over them to see and talk to the person next to you. Even before? Um, what about between the time the computer went in and, and the swastika went up? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the swastikas went up right about the same, same time, time that okay. the computer came in. Okay. So. so you had these little cubicles. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, who checked to make sure you were doing 50 claims a day? How did they do that? The computer did that automatically. Every day, um, your manager would get a printout of what you had paid the previous day and they would post that on a board so that everybody could see what everybody had, everyone else had done. And let's see, probably about six months to 
to a year, I can't remember exactly when, but um, after they installed the computer system, they also, um, they had a management team, um, management consulting firm, Lou Ballard come in mm -hmm. and do little um, stopwatch timings on people for paying claims. And before that, you just, you know, you had your certain quota of 50 claims a day. And um, when they did this little stopwatch study, they determined that certain claims were not really worth as much as other claims. And so they put a, a value on the different kinds of claims. For example, a drug bill. A drug bill is a pretty easy thing to pay. You stick in DR, that was the code. You didn't have to look any kind of code up. DR, the date and the amount, and you paid it. And you always pay drug claims to the claimant, so I mean there was no doctor involved or anything. So it was it was a pretty simple claim to pay. You got a point four for that. If it was um, a hospital bill, that could be a little bit more complicated because there could be you know ten pages worth of charges, and you get maybe one point two for that. So they they had what they called work units, and at first for the first six months to a year after they went on this work unit thing, they didn't tell us what a work unit was. They didn't tell us that a drug claim was only worth 0.4 and the hospital bill was worth 1.2. They just said, you know, instead of being the number of claims per day that you paid, the computer's now spitting out how many work units per day that you're, you're doing. And there didn't seem to be any correlation. I mean, we couldn't figure it out at any rate. Any correlation between the number of claims you paid and the number of that appeared on the sheet every day, saying how much you worked the day before. <laughs> and um, that was, that in itself was kind of distressing. When you don't know what it is that you're doing or not doing that's affecting your performance, you know? I mean, they um, also, when they went on to this work unit system, went to a, a little bit different system of um, salary increases before we were, um, reviewed once a year and given basically like uh, I guess merit raise we call it and we're also given cost of living raises automatically and on the new system they kind of did away with these well they didn't completely do away with the cost of living raises because they occasionally like once a year or once a year, every year and a half would um, jump the salary range for that particular number of work units, but what it was was every six months they would take your cumulative total of work units and determine how much you would get paid for that six month period. And then at the end of six months you'd be reviewed again and if your production went down, your salary would drop. If your production went up, your salary would increase. So you kind of were walking a fine line all the time as to you know how much you were going to get paid. You couldn't really count on a salary. you know you had to go out and buy a new car and you were making four twenty five a week, um, you couldn't guarantee that in six months you'd still be making that. You might drop down to three seventy five a week. And you know, that fifty bucks might be <laughs> and some people live on the edge like that too, so it was that was kind of a hairy situation. A lot of people weren't real happy with that. I know I wasn't real happy with that because I was scared to death. To me, it would have been, I never went down. I stayed exactly the same all the time. I was consistent. <laughs> but it was, to me, it was real stressful, worrying. And to me, it would have been a personal, um, I would have been embarrassed if my salary dropped. I mean, to me, that was just, that would have been a horrible thing to, have, to happen, you know? How many people did it happen to? Oh, it happened to a number of people. <laughs> Probably about, I don't know, maybe one quarter of the people had that happen. Most people, you, you, you get pretty consistent. I mean, you know, most people would, would stay about the same, but some people would just knock themselves out for six months and they get this huge salary increase because they paid very well for um, the industry. I mean, we were the top paid in the city of Atlanta in our industry. So, I mean, that part of it was good. But then, again, you had to deal with the stress all the time of, you know, 
okay, I did it for this six months, and, and you kill yourself to do it for that six months, and you just can't keep that up. To me, I, I couldn't, and I, that's why I never really did that. I never really tore into something and, you know, worked twice as long. A lot of people used to come in early and pre-process claims so that when they started work for the day, they'd just type. They'd just basically be typing. They wouldn't be doing any, you know, decision making during the day. And it, they allowed you to do that. If you wanted to come in early and sit at your desk and do whatever you wanted to do, you could do it. Hang on, say when you can type over. Okay, this is side two of an interview with Susan Nagy on the 17th of November. Okay, we were talking, basically it's piecework then. That's how, that's how I felt about it. And I was, I, I liked what I was doing. I liked paying claims and everything, and it, I thought it was interesting. But um, I was just real stressed out in that kind of environment. And it was real, it, it set up like this um, competition. I mean, the fact that they posted these things on the board every day, it, it set up this real cutthroat to some people competition that, um, I mean, they would dig through claims and look for all the easy ones and, and shove this pile of crap back in the, you know, claim drawer that every, you know, when you finished the stack of claims, you just went to the claim drawer and got a new piece of that. And, I mean, people pick through stuff and put it back and, and things like that where it was just, it affected the atmosphere at the office because of that. And, um, I might mention too that when we first started, we were working with about 200 people. Well, they, um, we, it, you know, through attrition, just started losing people. People changed jobs. And we kept getting, you know, smaller and smaller. The smaller and smaller group of people was handling the claim load. It wasn't like, you know, we were overloaded or anything. In fact, we used to get off early on Friday afternoons because if we didn't, we wouldn't have enough work to carry us through the next week. So they used to just let us go home. And um, so fewer and fewer people were being able to do the, the same amount of claims. And what I mean by fewer and fewer is like we, we were down to like half, 100 people were doing the claim load that before had taken 200 people. So I, it, it affected us a lot in that way too. How did that affect morale? Um, it kind of got worse and worse. I mean, also in the midst of all this, there were rumors, and you know how rumors can affect things. There were rumors that they were going to close our office, which they eventually did. <laughs> but we didn't know that for sure. Management kept saying, no, no, they're not going to do this. But we had heard that in the big picture, in the big scheme of things, that they were um, going to consolidate these smaller uh, offices all over. United States because they had offices in, in a million different cities. Fresno, you know, had a claims office. So they had all these small offices and they felt it would be more cost efficient to regionalize and just have a, a central location that all the claims in like the southeast would be paid out of. And we kind of were pretty confident that that southeast region would be in Atlanta. So we weren't real worried about it, but it was like, we knew that something was going on, even though management kept saying, no, nothing's going on, everything's just fine, don't worry about it. There were, you know, we knew that something was going on, and that doesn't affect morale very well. You know, when you think, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen next, you know. So, um, I think that probably had a bigger effect on morale than, than the fact that um, we could see that we were doing more, more or as much work with less less number of people. Was there a quota set for work units? Um, yeah, the quota was still basically the same. I think um, I'm trying to think. It, it it went up, but it went up to like 60. You had to do 60 work units a day, which kind of think of it that would have translated to about 70 75 claims a day. So it did. What was that? It went up by half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 50%. Yeah. So um, you did have to do more 
to process more claims in order to stay at the level that you were before. What happened when you didn't get clear? <coughs> um, well, I can't remember. I don't think they ever fired anybody for not producing. Um, your, once they went on to that salary based on your work unit, I mean, people just either left if they weren't doing real well. And normally that's what happened because if you weren't doing real well, the, the salary ranged from like, I think it was about $210 a week to like 425 I mean, there was this huge range depending on what your production was. And, um, you know, the people who were in the lower ranges making around a little over $200 a week could go elsewhere, you mm -hmm. know? And so they did. And so basically, I don't think they ever really fired anybody for not making their making quota because they, they didn't make very much money because they left on their own. <laughs> you mentioned that the 10 people who typed out checks were let go when you went online. They weren't all let go. Like, um, a, a couple of them were trained, retrained to to do processing. And so they didn't necessarily, they all, the company did always give you the option of being able to go somewhere else. They didn't totally just, at that point, they didn't lay people off. What about people who couldn't type? Were there anybody? I or couldn't was type. Was there anybody I should say? Uh -huh. no. I mean, I couldn't, I, the thing was most of the um, claim work that we did was with numbers. Mm -hmm. And so it, I was pretty good with it. 10 key and you can get pretty good with the 10 key when you use it constantly and um, there were a number of people that really couldn't type very well and that didn't seem to bother them a whole lot. There, was there them. another department then that was doing the typing part of typing in names and birth dates and things like that on the forms or did you um, do that? No we didn't well we did that sometimes I, I had responsibility for my own little group and when I got a new um, person to be covered by that group, I could go in and add them into the system and, and pay claims on them then. So I was able to add them. Initially, everybody was put into the system from New York, and they did it. How did that translate in your work units then? That would have slowed your claims processing down. I don't know. Now that you mention it, I have no idea whether you got any kind of work unit. I don't think you did. but. Then again, there weren't that many cases. I mean, you weren't adding that many new people. You maybe maybe added five people a week. You know, so it wasn't like that was a major part. And Scott took a second. Okay, we're back on after my taking a bathroom break. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you. You said a few minutes ago you were stressed out. How did you manifest that stress? First of all, <laughs> just. I wasn't sleeping as much, and I need eight hours really. Well, seven and a half. I can do one seven and a half. But to tell you the truth, what I noticed the most was that my eyes looked bad. I looked like I had aged, is what I noticed about myself. And I just felt like just fatigued, and I just couldn't deal with anything. Of course, I mean, at the time I was also going to school at night, and you know, there were other things in my life too that were. I suppose contributing to it, but it was like I didn't need this from work, <laughs> you know. And I really, I attributed most of my stressed out state to work because it was a situation that I really couldn't control. Whereas you know, the going to school part was something that I was doing because I wanted to do, and you know that I felt more in control of that. But that the work stress was something that you know. I just had to deal with every day, and I really couldn't do anything to change anything there, you know? So I think it was basically just the fatigue and not being able to sleep and feeling on edge all the time. Like how I drank a lot of coffee or something, and I never drank coffee. How did you handle the stress? <clears throat> I mean, you deal with it. You go through these things, and you just you deal with it. Um, I did drop out of school for a while simply because I feel, felt like I needed a rest. I needed to slow myself down a little bit. I just, so that was one thing that I could drop to try to, you know, regroup and, and 
get my energy level back up. <clears throat> um, that's all I can really think of is that I, I just tried to slow myself down a little bit. Oh, oh, I know, kind of think of it. One thing that I did a lot when I worked on that job that I could kick myself for doing was that, and I think it contributed worse to my stress out, really, was that I would come in, we were on flex hour time. Um, we could come in anywhere between, well, when I first started there, when we were on the manual system, yeah, it was any time between um, 7 and 9. And then once we went on the computer system, since we only had access to the system at certain hours, we had to, um, we could come in any time between 7.30 and 8.30, I think it was. So as long as you came in and worked your eight hours, you could go home. And what I started doing is I'd be there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'd stay there until 5, after 5 at night, you know? And um, why? Because to me, I, I'm sure this isn't true, but to me when I try, when I stretched it out a little bit, I was basically doing the same amount of work, but I didn't feel as pressured in a shorter period of time, you know? So, so to me, I'd come in and I'd, you know, pre-process a bunch of claims before I'd actually, you know, get on the system in the morning. And I'd do my work, and then at the end of the day, I'd, I'd do that extra few more claims, you know? Just put in a little bit more before the end of the day so that I would be sure that I'd have my, my quota for the day. because. What I tried to do was stay, like I said, I didn't fluctuate wildly. I was consistent about the number of claims I paid per day, so that, or the number of work units I did per day, so that, you know, at the end of, towards the end of the six month period, I didn't have to try to play catch up. I tried to consistently do the same amount each day, and I just, you know, at the end of the day, I'd throw in a few more, just for good measure, basically, just to make sure that I wasn't going to lose my salary when the six month review came around. So that was one one of my coping devices which, you know, I don't know like I said, I don't know if it really helped things at all. It just felt to me like I was relieved a little bit more. But then again I was spending an extra hour or more a day in this stress out situation. <laughs> you know, so I really don't think it helped. Although it seemed to psychologically make me feel a little bit better that I wasn't so wired when I was there. How did you see it affecting your co-workers? You mentioned the competition. Yeah. Um, I think that, that was the biggest thing to me, is that people just got real cutthroat with each other. And uh, it, in, a, in a certain way, though, it also kind of brought us closer together. I mean, by the time they actually closed our office, which, you know, the rumors finally did come true and that they were consolidating operations and they did not pick Atlanta as their base for the Southeast. So um, they did finally close us up and we, at that, at that point, it dwindled down to like 50 people. And 50 that people was... 50 people who were doing the work at 200 back then? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was a hardcore group. I mean, anybody who could stick around and do that for, it was, we were on the system at that point for probably three years by that time, a little over. I mean, they were hardcore people. They were there for the, it was just, you know, the type of people that you were. That's why you were still there, because the, you, could, you could handle that, you know, whereas these other people just got out. And so, in a way, we were kind of almost like a close-knit group by that time. Of course, it was such, such a small group again by that time that it, it was easier to be a little bit more close-knit than it was when you had 200 people there. They were survivors. But, yeah. But, but then again, too, there was still, there were little factions, that, warring factions, <laughs> you know. Why did you stay? Because it was a good company. I liked the company. I was real um, confident. I felt very confident that the management really knew what they were doing. I mean, the job that I was doing, like I said, I, I thought it was interesting and all. I didn't like the way it was set up with the work units and everything because I, you know, felt the pressure of it. But yet, um, I just liked the company and I liked my managers and. They were paying for me to go to school. That was probably the biggest reason I stayed, is because they were paying. 
and I really wanted my degree. And so I put up with it because that was a way for me to reach my goal. Who makes the management decision? Um, people, managers who can relate to the employees' feelings about things. I mean, to me, that is the biggest thing. The feelings needed to be expressed and aired, and, and our managers were pretty open, really, I thought. I mean, just because, even though you went in there and you might complain about something, it didn't mean that, that something would get changed because of, that you complained, but yet they were open in terms of, you know, hey, vent, <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. that, to me, I, I trusted you, them. Did you all let them know? that you didn't like the work unit system or that you didn't understand it? Yeah, sure. Like like I said, for a while we didn't know what um, work units were. Did and they? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they did. I'm, you know, I can't be certain, but I'm pretty sure they did. And when they did have complaints like, well, you need to tell us what these work units are. If we're supposed to be doing a certain number of them every day, we need to know what the heck they are. You know, and once once those kind of things came out, they said, "Yeah, okay, you're right. You do you do have a right to know this." And they gave us a list showing what you got for what. Um, they did send around surveys, employee surveys, you know, um, anonymous kind of things where you could write down exactly what you thought about the management, or exactly what you thought about what the company was doing, all that kind of stuff. Which um, you know, a lot of companies don't do that either. So. I mean, they were pretty, um, they tried to be in touch with their employees. Then again, there was, I met um, a person at one of the um, 95 summer school programs that worked in the Syracuse office of, Gold, uh, of uh, Equitable, and they were unionizing up there. And she was telling these real horror stories about their management and the, the conditions that they worked under that they had to wear gloves to type because their fingers were so cold because they kept the temperature in the room at between like 55 and 60 degrees. And they had to have gloves on because their fingers were freezing, but yet they couldn't type when they had gloves on and your finger, you know how you can't type when your fingers are cold? And, um, you know, so it was cutting down on their production and, and I don't know, I can't remember a number of the other gripes that they had, but it sounded to me like, um, they just had, in that particular office, they had poor management and um, that wasn't willing to listen, that wasn't particularly caring. And because of that, they had, they had problems. Whereas, you know, we didn't seem to have those, those kind of problems in our office. And like I said, a lot of it I, I attributed to the fact that our managers, were, I mean, they were firm, but they seemed more fair. To me, they seemed fair. You know, and they, they gave us little perks too. I mean, they let us off on, on Friday afternoons. I mean, they, they tried to do things. They had little parties for us. They tried to do things to keep the morale up because that isn't a real important part. You know, especially when, when you do feel real stressed about the work unit business and all that. And they knew that, so they tried to, to work with us more. Whereas I don't think that people, from what I understood of what Ms. Gull told me about what was happening in Syracuse, they just weren't like that in that particular office, and I didn't, don't think it was a company-wide thing, it was just a, an office problem. What happened when they announced that they were closing the Atlanta office? Um, most people kind of expected it. There were some people that were shocked about it, I guess, and I'm trying to remember if anybody really cried or anything. <laughs> um, It, it really wasn't a real big surprise to a lot of people because, okay, there had been these rumors about consolidation and we figured, oh, you know, Atlanta, this makes logical sense, Atlanta's going to be southeast, so we don't have that much to worry about. But yet there were also rumors that we had heard about them doing something in Charlotte, that it wasn't going to be Atlanta. So we kind of knew, and although at that point management kept saying, no, no, don't worry about it, you know, it's not because they wanted, of course they wanted to keep morale up, and they would be in, up a creek 
if all of us decided to bail out and they weren't ready with their operations in you know this other location, they needed people who knew what the heck they were doing in Atlanta, and they had a good group and they wanted to keep us around, you know. So um, of course they hush hushed up any rumors that started that that they were out there, and I mean it was just when you thought about all these different little signs along the way, especially when you would look back on them, it was like inevitable that this was going to happen. It was, you know, How long did they give you before they, between the time they announced and the time they actually closed the office? Not long. It was, um, I went in like the day after they announced it, I went home and I thought about things and I went in the next day to my manager and I said, please let me go first. Let me in, be in the first layoff because they were going to do it in stages. Um, it was going to be closed over like a nine month period and they were going to lay off, you know, six, eight, ten people at a time. And I said, let me go first. And within, I think it was within three weeks, I was gone. So it was, it was pretty quick after um, they announced it that they, the first group went. Why did you want to go first? Because at that point I had decided I had seven courses left to get my degree and I just decided that I wanted to go back to school full time and just get out and go well, pursue other options after that. They did give everybody the option to transfer to Charlotte. So I mean that that was offered to us. Did you consider that? No, not at all. I didn't want to go to Charlotte. <laughs> Forget it. So Were you involved in 95 right now at that time? Mm -hmm. I came involved with 95 probably about the second year I worked there. There's a uh, woman that I worked with there who was in the organization and she um, told me about some of the things that they were doing and um, they had a program on assertiveness training, one of their workshops, Saturday workshops. And um, I really felt like I needed this training. <laughs> so um, I went to that and I joined right there because I, I thought it was a worthwhile organization that was looking for type of things that I was glad that somebody was working for. You know. So I was with 95 probably for several years when I was there. How did that affect your work? Um, the more I got involved with 95, better I think I felt about myself and so um, the more I was willing to speak up about things that I felt you know needed to be uh, needed to have you know people pay attention to mm -hmm. so I got a little bit more vocal um, I do remember that there were a couple of us up there there was probably about maybe five people were involved in 95 and um, some of the people did not want management to know that they were involved with 95 because they felt that there might be some kind of repercussion and um, especially when the union, okay the Syracuse people were about to unionize and um, somebody from, I don't know, the AFL-CIO or what a union faction, I don't know, was um, picketing in front of our building <laughs> against Equitable. And um, we were sort of apprehensive about management thinking that we were involved in that because we were afraid, you know, that there would be some kind of repercussions against us because of the fact that, you know, if I was involved with the unionization of the Syracuse. Was there ever any discussion of organizing the offices? Yeah, there was. Um, I really didn't get involved in it a whole lot, but there were a number of women who um, felt that we needed the meetings. But, you know, I wasn't really that dissatisfied. Like I said, I kind of, I didn't necessarily like the job I was, you know, working um, with that kind of the pressure of the work unit thing. but. But I didn't, didn't really feel that it was that horrible, horrible of a situation that it needed, you know, that we needed the union representation for. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't feel that our managers were that unfeeling and caring about our needs that 
that we have to have a union for it to be meaningful. And typically, I was not, I was never a pro union type person anyway. So I, I knew that they talked, that there was a group that was talking about it, but I don't know exactly what all of that was about. Is there anything we haven't touched on that? that I haven't asked you about that you think needs to be covered? Gosh, not that I can think of. I've told the story to a lot of different people, but I don't I know, think I've ever been. A lot of I, I don't think I've ever been this thorough, though. <laughs> I mean, really, you've made me think about things that I haven't really even thought about, like training and all that. Is there any summary statement or anything about, do you th what do you think about the overall technology? Do you think it's good, bad, there, not, you know? I, I guess I still have real mixed feelings about it because I can see the advantages of it. And I think that, um, you know, if, if the United States is going to grow as a country and as an economy, that we need to have these kind of systems that will increase our production. But then on the other hand, being a part of a system like that and knowing how how it can affect you in, ne in negative ways, I don't know, I feel like there are, there are pros and cons to it. And I wouldn't want to stop progress. I would want to see it continue, but yet I hope that, that there'll be some kind of you know, regulation of what it does to the workplace. That it's not doesn't ruin people's <laughs> lives, basically. Anything else? Not that I can think. Okay, thanks lots of you. I really appreciate it.